Okay, this is lesson number five. We're going to talk briefly about dental assistant responsibilities. Now, I know I made a big list a few lessons ago about dental assisting and responsibilities therein. We're going to dig just a little bit into it. <clears throat> Let's talk first about what infection control is. Um, there are billions of bacteria in the mouth. Billions and billions. Uh, I read one study that estimated about 30 billion individual bacteria in the mouth. That's a lot more than, what is it, five, four, four or five times as many as, as many bacteria in the mouth as there are people on the planet. And some of those bacteria are pretty nasty. Not only that, but the bacteria that's in the blood, um, you know, tuberculosis, hepatitis, um, HIV, viruses, etc. These things can be very, very nasty. So it's really critical that infection control protocols be maintained precisely. Um, a simple mistake from the standpoint of uh, forgetting to sterilize something um, could have drastic, drastic effects. Now ultimately, infection control falls on the shoulders of the doctor. Um, it's my license that's regulated um, by the dental board and if I allow something to happen that shouldn't have happened, then it's on me. Um, now, that being said, certainly um, if something is happening that I'm not aware of, there's discipline that can take place um, because I should be very, very cautious with regard to who I employ and how I manage them. But that being said, infection control, cross-contamination protocols must be carefully and very clearly maintained um, every single procedure with every single patient. So we want to control for any blood-borne pathogens. Excuse me, any saliva or mucus-borne pathogens. Um, we want to maintain what's called universal precautions. That basically means that we treat all patients universally the same. We wear a mask, eye protection, gloves, we wash our hands, wear protective equipment, uh, depending on the office and the situation that may vary depending on uh, uh, what your particular um, uh, guidelines are. But uh, generally, we should not treat one patient who we know has hepatitis or HIV different from the way we're treating another patient. We should be treating them all at the same high standard with regard to um, infection control and cross-contamination protocol. It shouldn't change. Um, it's very critical that you understand that, that all patients should be treated essentially the same with regard to cross-contamination and infection protocols. So, there are specific infections that we need to be very cautious of. There are barriers involved and crystal clear sterilization rules that should always be followed with every procedure. So let me show you this case right here. This is uh, some hydrogen peroxide. It might have been isopropyl alcohol, a bottle that we had. Um, I went in to, to refill a, a bottle. Um, we have little um, containers that have a two by two soaked in isopropyl alcohol to wipe things down. And I grabbed that, and this is what I found. There's some blood on the edge of this bottle. I mean, obviously, that's someone's blood. I don't know whose blood it is. No one ever acknowledged that they left that there. But there is blood, dried blood, on the edge of this bottle. That's a blatant, blatant violation of everything in dentistry regarding cross-contamination protocol. Now, if I had not noticed that, um, if that blood had been fresh, if I had had some sort of an open wound on my thumb or my hand and gone to unscrew that bottle, I would have now contaminated myself with that blood. Now, who knows whose blood that is, what was in it, I don't know. Now, fortunately, I noticed it. We were able to solve the problem. We pulled the team in. We discussed cross-contamination protocol, reaffirmed what our policy was, and got it done. So here you can see Christine. She has universal barriers on. She's got her eye protection. She's got her mask. Um, and she's got her gloves and her PPE. Um, this is really cautious, really cr uh, critical um, that we be very cautious. Um, now you'll notice the stand-in here for the doctor does not have any of that on, but this is not necessarily a treatment setting. Let me direct your view here over here to the center where we have um, the high volume suction, the air water syringe, and the saliva ejector. And I zoomed in over here. You can see they're wrapped in plastic before they're used. These are wrapped in plastic and wiped down very clearly, um, conscientiously, to 
to make sure that all the bacteria from the previous patient is removed. Um, same thing here. This is the air water syringe on the doctor's side. High speed handpiece, um, initially wrapped in plastic, which I took off. And these are always sealed in baggies uh, before we start the procedure. They're left in their sterilization baggies before the procedure is started. So, all right. Here again is a, a picture of some cross contamination prevention protocol. So make sure everything is wrapped, sterilized, clean, ready to go for the next patient. That includes the floor and the light. Here are some more barriers involved. We've got a denture that came from the lab after a repair, which was no doubt disinfected by the lab, um, and then placed in this uh, sterile pouch to prevent uh, cross-contamination. Here are two curing lights, um, which are also wrapped. This is my cat, Jojo, who's going to help me with this lecture. Hi, Jojo. Can you get out of the way? I'm trying to lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> anyway, here's two curing lights over here, which uh, are also wrapped to maintain them being disinfected and sterilized. Um, this is what's called a velscope. The velscope is a really critical piece, which I like to use for um, oral cancer screenings. Um, you can see it's got its own barriers, two lens covers and a plastic barrier. Um, and then here's a set of instruments, a tray of instruments we use for recall appointments. You can see each individual piece is wrapped. Um, and these are all sterilized. They go through the um, autoclave, um, which is tested weekly to make sure that it's passing all the tests. And these are not opened until after the patient is seated and when the procedure is immediately ready to start. So they're not sitting there um, being exposed. Um, okay, so let's talk about the sterilization methods. There are lots and lots of techniques which most states acknowledge will do the job. Um, the one that's most commonly used is the steam autoclave. Um, it uses steam under pressure to sterilize, 250 Fahrenheit to 273 Fahrenheit, depending on the size of the load, that'll alter the time required. This has good penetration of the heat into the packages, causes corrosion of stainless steel instruments, and it does require drying time. So it's one of the slower processes, um, but it's the best. And if you plan ahead, do the job right. Um, if you have one or two autoclaves, or one big one or two smaller ones, or if you just plan ahead and have enough instruments, then generally it's not a big deal. But we don't ever want to sacrifice patient safety, health, and quality of care for time, and speed, and money. We should never in any way, shape, or form sacrifice those things. This right here is an autoclave. This is an ultrasonic bath. So the instruments are rinsed and scrubbed, then they're placed in the ultrasonic, which is, has a cold sterile liquid in there, and they're vibrated under ultrasonic waves for five or 10 minutes, depending on what protocol you use. Um, after which they're allowed to, to dry a little bit, and they're placed in sterilization baggies and inserted into the autoclave. Um, that helps us to get all the gunk off when they go through the ultrasonic, and then into the autoclave for the the actual sterilization. And here's that process. Here's the autoclave. Um, again, test we test it weekly. Here's the spore strip. Not to get too detailed in this basic lecture, but basically we put a strip that has bacterial um, capsules in it. Um, we run it through a cycle, and that strip, after it's run through our, the cycle in our machine, is shipped off, and the lab will attempt to culture, allow that um, bacteria to grow. Um, if it grows, then our machine's not working right and we get an alert immediately. Um, if it doesn't grow, we're good. So we do that every week. Occasionally you get a false positive. Um, if you get a, a, an actual positive, then it requires immediate action. Um, these trays have to be loaded very carefully and they have to be loaded very appropriately in certain ways so that the uh, instruments that are in them are clean and sterile um, after they come out of the machine. Again, it's 250 to 273 under pressure, um, and a lot of the metal instruments will become corroded over time, but it's definitely worth it to get them sterilized appropriately. Um, the sterilization process, it's really, really critical, again, that everything is sterilized and handled correctly, so we have certain disinfectants that we use on the surfaces that are touched during the process. Um, of course, gloves and barriers here. You can see the barrier, and then the mask, and then the patient napkin. Any sharps or biohazard material that need to be disposed of, they're incinerated. Um, we don't incinerate them on site, but they're incinerated by a, a service. Um, and 
then a bag valve mask for our AAD just in case someone has an emergency. These should always be in place because this is a really critical piece of the barrier that may be necessary in an emergency situation. Okay, so wrapping up that section. What is the minimum temperature necessary for steam autoclave sterilization? I said it several times. Um, what is a barrier designed to do? And name two bloodborne pathogens. This is not something that I mentioned. Let's see how, how, good you're, how good you are. So pause it here, take a couple of minutes, answer these questions. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide which has the answers. So 250 degrees Fahrenheit is the minimum temperature necessary for steam autoclave sterilization. Uh, barriers designed to prevent cross-contamination. That's one extra step. Now we wipe it down after we use it, we put a barrier on it. That way if there's any chance that we didn't wipe it down correctly or missed some minute nook or cranny in the handle of whatever, um, now there's a barrier over the top as a, as a failsafe. Um, two bloodborne pathogens, hepatitis and HIV. Those are probably the two big ones that we worry about. So that is the end of lesson five. Thanks for watching. We will see you in the next lesson.